Go ahead and open to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. And if you are an overachiever, go ahead and open to Matthew 27, uh, Mark 15, and Luke 23. Um, however, we are going to be camping out in John predominantly. <clears throat> so here we are with Jesus having been arrested, undergoing trial. We've now seen the um, illegal trials of the Jews. He was handed over to Pilate. Pilate was very eager and happy to pass on the responsibility to Herod, but Herod um, didn't get what he wanted, so he sends him back to Pilate. And so now we have the situation where we're coming to uh, the last, the final, the sixth uh, kind of trial or hearing of Jesus <clears throat> and we're going to see where he ends up finally being condemned to be crucified. And so here, that, that's just laying out the situation. Of course, now here what we're going to do is we're going to see um, not merely that he is condemned to crucifixion, but through the events that unfold, he is, we're also given this picture of grace and mercy and the reward that we have received in Christ that he has taken our place because as Jesus was kneeling in the garden in prayer somewhere in Jerusalem a prisoner slept who had no idea what the next day was going to bring for him while Jesus was being drugged before courts and councils while Jesus was being mocked and beaten by soldiers Barabbas sat in a jail cell thinking his fate had been sealed and the end was near. However, what we will see unfold is that God had other plans. <clears throat> so starting in verse 38 of John 18. So Jesus had been to Herod. He's been returned to Pilate. Verse 38 says that Pilate went out again to the Jews, starting about midway in the verse. Pilate went out again to the Jews, and he said to them, I find no fault in him at all. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they all cried out, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. I'm going to stop right there for a second. Because um, that, that, that comment of Barabbas being a robber, it's just a generic term for criminal. And that brings up an interesting point that I, I, I want to take the opportunity to explain how this passage, if you look at it over all four Gospels, actually defeats a common criticism about the Gospels and the Bible in general. There are critics who will say that the um, idea that Jesus was God incarnate, the, the idea of um, Jesus as the Savior, that this is all things that developed over time. It was later legend that was added on to the maybe historical person. Maybe there really was a carpenter and he really was a traveling preacher. But they, they, they say it evolved over time. And one of the things they'll point at to say it evolved over time is the differences in the Gospels. Um, one common thing they'll point at is in the, the kind of burial resurrection narratives. They'll say, um, Mark is the first gospel that was written. I, I personally think it was Matthew, but that's you know neither here nor there. Um, but they'll say, Mark was the first gospel written. It's the simplest. It's the basic. It gets straight to the point. Not a lot of frills. And then Matthew wrote, and he used some of Mark, and then Luke wrote, and he relied on them but added more. And then John wrote, and John, writing the latest, is where you get all the fantastical, miraculous things. And they say that was the order that they're building on. It's evolving. It's developing. And so this legend grew out. The problem is that here in the story of Barabbas, it works in the exact opposite order. If you take a view of the Bible evolving the story through the Gospels, then you look at, Barab at the story of Barabbas being released, and we're all familiar with the story. But the story of Barabbas is simple. John actually presents the most basic, most straightforward, no frills um, story of Barabbas. 
right, that, that there is this custom at Passover, uh, that Pilate is finding no fault in Jesus, um, that Jesus is referred to as king of the Jews. Crowds are demanding Barabbas be released instead of Jesus, right? You have Pilate appealing to the crowd. You have um, that he releases Barabbas and um, calls for Jesus' crucifixion, and it describes Barabbas as a robber, as a criminal. But that's the basic story we all know. But if you dig into the details, it actually, um, and if you use this kind of evolution of the story view, then you would have to say, well, okay, well, the next one would be Luke, because Luke has all of that, but he adds in that Barabbas um, isn't just a criminal, he's a rebel and a murderer. But then in Mark, you have not only all of that in him as a rebel and a murderer, Mark mentions that it's the chief priests, the whole reason of this. It says Pilate knows that they're just envious of Jesus and that it's the chief priests stirring up the crowds. And Matthew includes all of that, but then Matthew adds in that uh, Pilate, you know, right, where he washes his hands, that's in Matthew, right? He says, this isn't on me that he washes his hands of it, and it has the part where Pilate's wife will actually come to Pilate and say, hey, I had a vision, have nothing to do with this man. So if you take this idea that the story's evolving over time, here you have the order that would be John, Luke, Mark, and Matthew. But that goes completely against what scholars want to say from other things, that it's Mark, Matthew, Luke, John. So you can actually pick out different stories from the Gospels, and depending on um, the amount of details each one includes, you could come up with a different order of the Gospels just depending on which story you're claiming evolved. And if you can pick any story and have any different kind of order, depending on the passage you're looking at, then this idea that the Gospels are an evolution of legend over time just falls flat, dead in the water, it has no standing. And so this issue over Barabbas actually shows us that this mindset that a lot of critics have as they approach the Gospels doesn't actually hold up. Okay, that was just taking a little side trip there. Let's get back into the passage. And we're going to see a few more things where the Gospel critics fall apart. Chapter 19, verse 1. So, so then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe, and they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. <clears throat> Interesting question that you wouldn't notice just from this passage, but if you remember the last week when we were looking um, in the Gospel of Luke, whenever Jesus is before Herod, it tells us that Herod's soldiers put a robe on Jesus. And so the question comes up, well, who put the robe on Jesus? Was it Herod's soldiers or was it Pilate's soldiers? And I've already seen a couple people mouthing the answer. Both. There is no need to create contradictions and conflict where none is necessary. <clears throat> See, according to Luke, Herod's Soldiers mocked Jesus, beat Jesus, put a robe on him and mocked him as, ha ha, you're the king. And then they sent him to Pilate. It actually appears that he still had the robe on when they sent him to Pilate. That's one of the last things they did was beat him, mock him, throw a robe on him, and then they sent him to Pilate. But then what happens is Pilate's soldiers whip him. Well, they would have taken the robe off and whipped him. And then they put the robe back on, and then now they add in the crown of thorns. And so there's no contradiction. People want to invent contradictions where there is no reason at all to see one. However, there is one. There is a contradiction that people will point out that this one might make you go, wait a minute, this actually does seem to say two different things. As we just read in John 19, 2, it says that the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they put on him a purple robe. But over in Matthew Matthew's gospel says they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. Uh-oh. So what was it? Was it purple or was it scarlet? Well, there's actually a few different ways that people have looked at this and said, well, this is easy. Right? One, maybe it was multicolored. Maybe a predominant color was scarlet and it had some purple mixed in and, you know, 
different colors stuck out to different people. That, that, that's possible. Maybe it looks like different colors to different people. Do you remember, was it last year, the year before, where there was this thing going around where it was a woman, picture of a woman in a striped dress? And the, picture, and the question was, what color is the dress? And it was either like white and brown or black and blue. You know, and depending on who you asked, you know, there were some people who looked at that and clearly they obviously saw the truth that it was white and brown. And there were other people that were mistaken. And they thought it was the other color, right? But depending, there was something about your own eyes and the way you looked at it that this exact same dress looked a little bit different color. Maybe that's what's going on here, that the difference <clears throat> has to do with the person looking at it. Um, there's the fact that the names of colors actually uh, cover a wide range of shades. Just yesterday, um, my middle child, Annabelle was saying, you know what my favorite color is? My favorite color is turquoise. And my second favorite color is blue. Well, as you well know, turquoise is actually a shade of blue. Right, but you can just get a little more specific. You can use the same word to describe multiple shades. And actually, between scarlet and purple, there's some overlap. So there's that possibility as well, which is probably the most simple. There is the idea some people have put forward is that you just kind of get used to calling things a certain thing, that, that royalty wore purple, that the, 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 the type of purple, the type of dye that they would wear in that area, it was a purple robe. And so that's just what you call it, regardless of if it's faded, if it's a little off color, if maybe it's a little more scarlet than it is purple, it's still called a purple robe that because a purple robe is just the name of a royal robe. Kind of the same way there's people who call everything, every soda drink in the world is a Coke. Right? It doesn't matter what the exact flavor or brand is, they just call it a Coke. It's the same idea maybe going there. Um, how many of you have a white shirt that is no longer white? Do you still call it a white shirt? You do. And so there's that idea, which would actually make sense because they're not going to put some nice, fancy, brand new, bright purple robe on Jesus. They're probably going to take one of the old ones that was a cast off, you know, out of the back of the closet, probably got some holes in it from moths, and they're going to throw that on him. So it's probably faded anyway, where the purple is already looking a little more scarlet. And so that is several different ways how you could end up with two people describing the same thing using two different words, and they're both right. Could have been it could have been reversible. I like it. There you go. Purple on one side, scarlet on the other. So there, I mean, there, there's another one. So there's all these different ways that there's no contradiction at all. And it's just amazing. Again, people who do not want to believe the scripture will go out of their way to come up with things. To call it into question. <clears throat> okay. So they beat him. They put the robe on him. Verse 4. Pilate then went out again, and he said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. And then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to him, Behold the man. Therefore the chief priests and the officers saw him, and they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Now this is where, over in Matthew's gospel, he records Pilate's wife has a vision and comes to him and says, have nothing to do with this man. And Pilate would have nothing more than to have nothing to do with this man. He wants nothing to do with this whole situation. But the crowds kind of backed him into a corner. And so Pilate said to them, you take him and you crucify him, for I find no fault in him. And the Jews answered, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself to be the Son of God. Verse 8, therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid. And he went again to the praetorium, and he said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. And Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? And Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. 
From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. And when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was, <clears throat> excuse me, now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold your king. And they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. And then they delivered him to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. Wow. <clears throat> There's three things I want to point out here that unfold during, during this trial, which is barely a trial. It's a mob demanding. I mean, you can almost just call it a lynching. It just so happens the police are involved too. So you have three things I want to point out. The depravity of man, the sovereignty of God, and the grace of Christ that stand out in this episode. First, you have the depravity of man. Right? Pride and selfishness, selfishness lead us into places we may otherwise would think we would never go. In verse 15, the chief priests answered. This just blows my mind. Stop and think about this. The chief priests answer, we have no king but Caesar. The Jews hate Rome. They hate Caesar. They despise him and his oppression. For them to now stand here and say, we have no king but Caesar. <clears throat> Even worse than that, who is the king of Israel? God. God is Israel's king. So for them to say, we have no king but Caesar, arguably is blasphemy. So here we have the leadership of the nation of Israel standing publicly proclaiming sin and blasphemy and that Caesar is their king. Why are they doing that? Well, as was mentioned before, Matthew and Mark record that Pilate sees this and he knows they're envious. He, he knows the whole reason they turned Jesus over to him to be crucified is envy. Jesus' teachings opposed their own. Jesus' following threatened their own position. And whereas they had obedience because of their position, the people loved Jesus. People followed him out of genuine desire to. <clears throat> But that raises the question, if the people love Jesus so much, then how come there's now a mob demanding that he be crucified? How is it that the crowd turned on Jesus so easily? I mean, think about it. Just a few short days ago was the triumphal entry where they were throwing palm branches on the ground, worshiping and singing glory to God in the highest. And now here we are as a mob cries out for his crucifixion. It's interesting as Matthew and Mark actually record that it's the chief priest stirring up the crowds. Kind of wonder why is there a crowd there in the first place? Did maybe somebody send out word? Hey, let's gather a crowd. Let's organize a crowd, a mob, so that we can put pressure on Pilate to get what we want. And the crowd is motivated, motivated by what they perceive as a false messiah. Jesus is a con man. You have the priests bring in a crowd. You know, they're probably bringing people they knew were more sympathetic to their view anyway. And so they're bringing in a crowd and they're stirring them up. And the whole point is that he can't be the messiah. Because what is it that the people were expecting the Messiah to do? He was supposed to overthrow Rome. He was supposed to beat Rome, not get beaten by Rome. And so the very fact that he was arrested to them would be evidence, well, he can't be the Messiah. He's a con man. All these things he's been doing, he's been misleading us. And so Jesus' arrest 
and flogging, and their mind shows he can't be the Messiah. So that's how they were so easily turned against him in just a few short days. And it makes sense if that's your expectation. Because as I love the, um, it was C.S. Lewis came up with the, the, the trilemma. There's only three things you can do with Jesus. You look at the things that Jesus taught, he's either a liar, which is what they're thinking. He lied. He lied to us. There's no way he can't be the Messiah. Or he's a lunatic, because only a crazy man is going to claim that he's God. Or he actually is who he claimed to be. And then the Jews just go full, full throttle into depravity, willing to be cursed for their own actions. In Matthew 27, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but in Matthew 27, 24 and 25, it was a crazy. It says, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, so there's a mob and they're getting chaotic, <clears throat> he took water and he washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of this person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. So, so they're even saying, you know what? If he is innocent, we're wrong. We'll take that guilt. We'll take that punishment. Just crucify him. So stirred up and angry are they. You see the pride and the selfishness stirring people. Pilate for his own cowardice. He's giving over to the mob and willing to condemn an innocent man who he's actually duty-bound to protect. You have the priests due to their envy or calling for the death of an innocent man. And the Jews, for their pride, are willing to take responsibility on themselves and on their descendants for the death of an innocent man. Which, by the way, just a quick note about that whole on us and our children thing. The Bible actually teaches that um, children are not responsible for their parents' sin in Ezekiel 18.20. It says, The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The, righteous of the, right, <clears throat> the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. God does not punish children for their parents. And here they're even saying, Yeah, you know what? We'll take the responsibility for this. We'll even let the punishment be on our kids if we're wrong. How wicked they quickly become. If you ask anyone involved in this, I mean, you stop and think about it. If you asked anyone in that courtyard who's demanding the crucifixion of Jesus, if they would have ever stood up, demanded innocent man, cheered for Caesar, called a curse upon themselves in case they're wrong, how many of them would have said, oh, absolutely, I'm right there? I'm sure, ever, almost every one of them would have said, not me, I would never do that. But how many of us think of ourselves committing certain deeds and certain sins and certain acts and we think, not me. Oh, I would never do that. How many of us have said that and then later find ourselves doing exactly that? You don't have to raise your hand. I'll raise my hand for you. <clears throat> right, what's the saying? There but by the grace of God go I. We've talked before about the just wicked, wicked, depraved things that happen in the world. They're not committed by a special breed of evil people. It's everyday, regular folks. Right? And, and the big example that we can all point at because we all know that it was just hor horrific and despicable is the Holocaust. Millions of people put into camps and slave labor and labor camps and concentration camps and death camps. Well, that wasn't just a small little bit of maybe some Nazi soldiers doing that. Think the guy driving the train full of Jews to the concentration camp wasn't just a guy driving a train? It took hundreds of thousands of ordinary folk punching a clock, going to work, to bring about the deaths of millions. Regular people do, ooh, regular people do that. We all have that within us. The sin and the pride, which is the seed of wickedness, is in us all. So we see the depravity of man. Second, we see the sovereignty of God. In John 19, verses 10 and 11, 
says, Pilate said to him, are you not speaking? Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Pilate is arguably the most powerful man in the region. He commands the mightiest, deadliest military force to have ever walked to the earth up to that point. And as military governor of the area, he has supreme power as Caesar's representative to just command it, and it better be done. But even he can't thwart the will of God, but rather he has his part to play. Think of all the pieces of this that had to come together. Pilate, who ordinarily may not even have been in the town, he, he, he goes around the region, happened to be in Jerusalem on that day. You had to have the envy of the priest. You had to have the vote of the unanimous vote of the Sanhedrin. You had to have the betrayal by Judas. You had to have the anger of the crowd, the cowardice of Pilate, and who knows what else. All of these things had to come together to accomplish the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And whenever that baby was born in the manger in Bethlehem, it was already known this day would come. Any one of these things being gone, and you may not have Jesus on the cross. And yet, they are all accomplished by freely made decisions of rational thinking people who chose to do what they did and be where they were and play the part they played. See, God is not a puppet master pulling the strings of everything, that every little thing that everyone's going to do. Rather, in his omniscience and in his sovereignty, God is able to bring about his purposes through the actions and free choices of others. <clears throat> I've actually seen it like this before where you kind of think of a... Um, you ever seen like a, a chess master? Like a master. Somebody's just like really good at chess. I, I've, there, there's a few different people that I follow. Um, so it's teachers that I've probably referenced. Uh, Tim McGrew is one. Uh, John, oh goodness, I'm going to butcher this name, Sarfati. I think, anyway, um, they're, they're both the kind of people that can play like multiple opponents at once, blindfolded. I, I mean, just stop thinking about that. They're blindfolded. They're playing multiple people. I, I mean, I've heard of them playing you know, up to like 13, 14 people at one time, blindfolded. So they have to remember all the positions, all the different strategies on all these different boards, and they win every one of them. Now, you take someone like that and put them up against like a 10-year-old kid who's just learning to play. They will run that kid all over the chessboard. They'll know the moves they're going to make before they make them. But who's choosing to make the move? They are. They're not making them do anything. They're choosing to do it. They're the one playing. They're the one moving their pieces. But the master is such in control of the chessboard, he can control the outcome. <clears throat> Same kind of idea with God. So we have the depravity of man, the sovereignty of God, and the grace of Christ being shown. We are a sinful people accountable to a sovereign, righteous, holy creator, and the holy judge will preside over our trial. We've got things to answer for, and he is just, and he is holy, so what hope can there be for us? You have to stop and wonder, as Barabbas was sitting in that cell and his whole life turned around in one morning. Whenever he woke up that morning, he knew he was most likely destined for the cross. And he deserved it, and there was nothing getting him out of it. But he set free robber, murderer, notorious criminal, terrorist, is set free while Jesus goes to the cross. The story of Barabbas parallels our own story. Amen? We have all sinned, and Scripture points out that the wages of sin is death. But, not, <clears throat> but then, due to nothing we've done, due to nothing we've deserved, due to nothing that is in our own power, Jesus changes places with us. 
He bore the punishment that we rightly deserve. And like Barabbas, we are allowed to go free with no condemnation. That's what the Bible says, Romans 8, 1. There is now no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Jesus <clears throat> suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. You ever wonder what happened to Barabbas after his release? Fact is, we don't know. We're not told. The Bible doesn't say. There's not even any other historical documents to say. There might be some traditions here or there, but there's nothing that tells us what happened to Barabbas. Did he just go back to his life of crime? Woo, thank goodness that's over. Come on, boys, let's get after it. Was he grateful? Did he eventually become a Christian? I mean, that, that can be a powerful, powerful thing when you realize I came this close to the chopping block. And he took my place. Was he affected at all? We don't know. But the choices that were available to Barabbas are available to us all. Surrender to God in grateful acknowledgement of what Christ has done for us, or we can spurn the gift and continue living apart from him. That's the choice that Barabbas faced. I mean, could you imagine as he gets out and he realizes what has happened? I mean, chances are he probably knew who Jesus was. I mean, surely he'd heard of him. Can't hardly be in Jerusalem and not know who Jesus is. He's got to know that he's a rabbi. He's a teacher. And people are saying he's the Messiah. Miracle worker. And he's taking my place? He, he's getting crucified and I'm letting go? It's got to have an impact. You, you imagine you think that would have an impact on him. And as our prayer that it would have an impact on us. That as we realize we are sinners, we are criminals before a righteous, just, and holy God. And Christ took our place. Are we going to acknowledge that and repent of our sins? Or are we going to spurn that gift and continue living a life apart from God? Every time I feel the walls closing Recover me and breathe life in me again Lord, though I feel the darkness come I will not fear, you've ransomed me with blood